Well, good day. It's Corey McKernan here. Well, you're probably wondering why I'm sitting here with my Augusta National hat on. I've just had the pleasure of sitting down with the great uh, Gary Player for about 30 or 40 minutes and to be able to pick his brain about his mindset, the way he goes about his life, um, the way he looks after himself. You would never have guessed uh, he's nearly 86 years old. And if it's something that we can all learn in today's environment, I'm sure this walk with me online, which is brought to you by National Make Good Solutions, Platinum Talent Management and Oz Equipment Hire. It's one of the best ones that we've ever done and one that I thoroughly enjoyed. And I hope you enjoyed it, enjoy it as much as I did doing it. So enjoy. Well, walk, uh, welcome to Walk With Me Online, very special edition where we talk to the leaders in sports, business and entertainment about their journeys and their habits that help attain their physical and mental fitness. And if there's been anyone in the history who's lived the mantra of physical and mental fitness, it's Gary Players, won over 160 tournaments and won a career Grand Slam by the age of 29. For, for those that don't know, that's the British Open, the US PGA, uh, what else have we got? The US Masters, I've left one out there, Gary. US Open. US Open. Yeah. Yeah. So by the age of 29, and I could go on all day, but he's golf's true global ambassador. A very warm welcome to Mr. Gary Player. How are we going? I'm doing fine, thank you, mate. Uh, it's lovely to be able to talk to you. I see you've got your master's hat on. Well, not many people have got a master's hat, but you've also caddied in the tournament. So probably in a couple of years' time, you might play even. <laughs> I only wish, mate. Uh, now, I was very lucky to meet you on the practice tee at Augusta National. And, you, and your words, um, you wouldn't believe this, had a very profound effect on me. You gave Michael Campbell a little bit of a mini speech that always, about always being able to find a way. Um, I think it's such a great mindset to have in sport or life about that mantra that you said to Michael on the tee that day that I distinctly remember about always being able to find a way. Well, that's right. And, uh, you know, golf is such a difficult sport. At college, I was a four-letter man, but uh, I can tell you that golf is more difficult than all four of those sports put together. Golf is really the most difficult. It's a scientific sport. You speak to Michael Jordan, you speak to any of the athletes from other sports, they all recognize how tough golf is. And you never, you, you, you know, you go to your grave not knowing everything about the game. You know a hang of a lot about nothing. When you think about it, Corey, it's a one second movement and there've been over 4 million words written about it. So, mm. I mean, everybody knows a hell of a lot about nothing, but uh, that's the challenge. And you've got to be over to when you're not playing well, find a way. Uh, the way that you find, it all stems from the mind. The mind is the most incredible machine. We haven't even got to first base with it yet. We're in our infancy. I try and work on the mind some way or other every single day. I've just come from the gym and I'm using my mind in the gym, a completely different than I would be doing it on the golf course. But I always relate it back to the mind. Can you imagine Einstein said we use 10%. Can you imagine if we could use 20% how effective we would be? So you've got to be able to, and this is what superstars, and I've only seen about 15 superstars in my 70 years of playing golf. They... They find a way to play. They enjoy adversity. They love the ad adversity. Never feel sorry for themselves. Never quit trying. Um, being able to take a few boos or nasty words said at you, uh, even though you don't deserve it. Uh, you say, you know, so many people say, well, it's not fair. Life is not meant to be fair. Nothing is fair. So it all comes from the mind. And you find a way. Uh, and you must... For example, you, you might be playing and not, you, you might kid yourself. You know, I'm not playing well today because I'm swinging a bit too fast. You might, you might not be swinging fast, but your mind convinces you that that's right. So you've got to find something in your mind that convinces you that you're going to play well. It's mind over matter. It's strength of mind. It's mind hypnotism. Uh, kidding yourself when you're playing badly that you're playing well. I, I could go on to this. Ad lib. Now, um, 
I think you said a very important one there that, and especially in this crazy time, is that what you've probably been able to do through the pandemic? I know everyone was shocked by it initially, but have you then just gone, you know what, I've actually just got to embrace this adversity because that's one point that I just picked up on what you just said then. Well, the COVID is a very interesting thing. You know, my dad said to me when I was a young boy, always respect other people's opinions, even though you feel you're emphatic that you're right. But yeah. listen to the other person's opinion because you might learn something. COVID is not something, and I have, not, I have as much respect for COVID as anybody has. Uh, it has never perturbed me. I've never gone around thinking, oh, I might, be, I might get COVID. I have had my vaccinations. I didn't want to. I did not want to have that crap put into my body, but <laughs> I did it. Uh, I personally believe that that's right. There are people that believe it's not right. But to me, COVID, when I think of the harm that it's done to people being locked up, people in a two apartment uh, bedroom apartment, not going out, what it does to their health, what it does to a marriage, you know, when you're living with that woman all day long, every day, what it does to obesity, what it does to people that have got uh, depression, what it does to people overeating, you could, people not exercising, you can go on and say, well, what does more harm, going out in public or being locked up. That's mm. a matter of opinion. I think a lot of people are getting COVID. It's become very political, by the way, but people are not in shape. Now, you must understand, people don't worry about their bodies. If you take a great country like Australia, one of the greatest sporting nations, one of the greatest countries on the planet, I don't know how many people in Australia, you've got 25 million people. If you have a million people that exercise, I'm just sucking a, 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 name, a, a number out of verbatim. If you had to have a million people exercising, it'd be a lot. A lot of people start exercising, they quit after a year. Not many people worry about their body. Your body is a holy temple. If you eat properly and you exercise and you laugh a lot and you have unmeasured love in your heart, you, I tell you what, people that are really fit have got a much better job. Me, I would be hammering home if I was a government. Guys, we got, a, we got COVID here. Exercise, get in shape. Go for walks in the nighttime. You know, it's, I have a different, completely different attitude about it. And the other thing is, you take flu. Now, flu is probably going to kill more people than COVID will. Flu has been here for a long time. It's going to be here forever. I think COVID will probably be here forever. What do we got to do? Run and hide? No, we got to get out and face it. But face it in the right way by mm. eating properly, sleeping properly, not over drinking, not overdoing it. There's a a healthy way of getting over. That's my way of combating. Yes, I might get it. I might die of it. But so what? I can't. I can't be living, be locked up. I can't do that. I'd rather die. Exactly. Now, um, I think one of the the favourite sayings of all time about about luck, about the harder you work, the luckier you get. Just um, for those Australians that don't know how that come about <laughs> with the with the Texan that happened to be there when you hold a bunker shot and the the story behind that. Well, I'm in Dallas, Texas, and I was there the other day with David Graham, the wonderful Australian golfer. What a wonderful yep. ambassador he's been for Australia, winning the US Open and the PGA. I just love David Graham, Hall of Famer. Anyway, we were playing together, and I reminded me, I told him the story. I was hitting bunker shots in Dallas, and this guy came out with this beautiful cowboy uniform on, which I just love, the cowboy hat and the boots. And he's watching me hit a bunker shot and I put it in the hole. He said, gee, son, that was, that was really nice. I said, yes, sir, thank you. He says, you think you could do it again? I said, no, no, the odds are stacked up against you doing two in a row, just doing one. Anyway, I hit it, went in the hole. Now, it's the third one. He says, I tell you what, son, if you hold that, I'll give you $500. Brand new notes he took out of his pocket, just like his brand new suit. And he held them like this. And would you believe that, Corey, I knocked it in the hole? <laughs> so he says, he, he's chewing a little bit of tobacco and he went, he said, that's the luckiest thing I have ever seen. I said, yes. I, spontaneously, I said, the luck, harder you work, the luckier you get. And that is such a true saying. You know, how, when I think of how hard I worked, I was small in stature. I didn't have the power and the strength that Palmer and Nicholas had, but I was fitter than they were. And I've outlasted them. I mean, Palmer couldn't break. 95 when he was my age on my home course here, I still go around and par. 
Nicholas Carr, he struggled to break 90. I go around and par. I shot four under par the other day for nine holes. So I, I can still really play. I work hard. I represent a lot of companies. I design golf courses. I go around the world like I'm 40. I just come from the gym right now. And I walked out of there and you can take this as boasting or you can take it as something that I'm proud of. I walked out and said, you know, I really am proud of myself that I've kept this going since I was nine years of age. And I promised my brother who went to war at 17 with the Aussies and the South Africans that I would do this until the day I die. And I've adhered to that. And I walked out of the gym. Today I did 150 sit-ups. I, I did a lot of squats. I ran on the treadmill, flat out, flat out. And uh, you know, I still pushed 350 pounds with my legs on a leg press. And I did my push-ups and I, I, I did my, my, my deadlifts, which is a hard exercise. I did all these exercises. I said, gee, I'm 86. I feel like I'm 40. I still work hard. I still travel all around the world, really busy. I said, you know, it just, and I try and eat well and I sleep well. You know, I sleep last night. I slept 11 hours. But, and also I laugh a lot. That, that's one of the big secrets. And that's what Aussies do. You know, that's, I just, can never tell you when I talk to you here today, I get goose pimples when I think of Oz that I might not never go back there again. I get quite choked because I just loved Australia. They loved me. I loved them. What a country. It was just an experience in my life. And the, one of the greatest performances of my life is not being the only man to win the Grand Slam on the regular tour and the, and the senior tour in the world. But one of the greatest performances of my life happened in Australia at Royal Melbourne. We were playing in France at St. Nombre Bratesh, the golf course, and we were fogged out. And the travel agent came to Arnold Palmer and myself and said, look, uh, I can only get to Royal Melbourne if everything goes right three hours before you play. Arnold said, well, I'm not going. Jack said, I'm not. I said, I'm going. So I traveled. Now, why in those days you did that? Paris, New York, New York, Hawaii, Hawaii, Fiji, Fiji, Sydney, Sydney, Melbourne, got there three and a half hours before I played, had never played Royal Melbourne. I was using Slazenger equipment, got a new set of clubs and that ball, never seen the course, won the Australian Open by seven shots. Now that is something that I have never, ever forgotten. And, uh, you know, to win the Australian Open seven times, every time I went there, every time I went there, I won tournaments. I traveled from Darwin, Alice Springs, Wagga Wagga, you name the place. <laughs> I, young, I went to them all. And I used to travel in a pair of underpants and a hot car with no air conditioning at 25 pounds a game. And I will forever be indebted to Australia because it enabled me to marry one of the most incredible women the planet has ever known. I was with her for 72 years. And unfortunately, she just died just over a month ago. And I said, if I win the Ampol tournament, which was 5,000 pounds at Yarra Yarra Golf Club in Melbourne, I said, we'll get married. But I said, I don't know if I'm good enough to really beat all these guys from all over the world. Well, I won it by four shots and I got married to this girl through Australia. Thank you, Ozzy. And is, uh, is that something like when you, when you mention all that, like in today's travel standards, everyone would hear you rattle off the places that you just went. Is that something that the golfers of the last 20 or 30 years have missed out on really? You know, I mean, that, that, take, that would have been incredibly tough to, to go through all that travel and then still have a mindset to go and perform. Is that, is that something that I'm not saying today's golfers have got it easy with all the jets and the G5s and all this sort of stuff, but is that something that made you a little bit tougher in terms of being able to perform under all, those, all that duress? No question. And the guys of today, you know, they do have their own jets. Uh, they do have a first price of a million dollars every year. 30th yeah. place makes more money than I used to make in a year. Well, that's great that they're making all this money, but they do have a different life. And I started off, I wanted to have the best world record in golf. And I can sit here and say, I do have the best world record in golf. Yeah. I just wanted to go and win the Australian Open. I wanted to win the Brazilian Open. I wanted to go to win in China and Japan and Africa and Europe all over. I wanted to do that because to me, that was the ultimate challenge to be able to get off a plane and go and beat guys that live there 
and don't have time changes and are at home. That was the ultimate. And I wanted to be the international champion. And I achieved that. Yes, if I'd lived in America, I would have won a lot more majors than I did, but I, I don't want to change it. I'm very, very happy with my career and the friends and the education and the experiences that I've had that none of these guys will ever have. Mm. I mean, how many of them will ever go to Australia and know what it, it's like? How many will, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken in the villages mm. of Africa and the poor villages of India, and I've been around the highest echelon. Every president, I mean, with my wife died, presidents, prime ministers, royal family, people from all over the world send messages to me. I mean, that, that's something that's something I can go to my grave with, of, with great delight and joy, not just being insular and just playing in your home country all the time. It's just a matter of opinion. That's what I wanted. This is what they wanted. No, I didn't worry about money. I, didn't, I wanted to win. I wanted to win. And man, I was uh, an animal with practice. I, this pair of hands you're looking at on your screen hit more balls than any human being that's ever lived by a mile. Now, VJ Singh, he's starting to claim that. I said, hey, VJ, you, you've got another 30 years till you get to my age, and I haven't stopped hitting balls yet, my friend. And is that, do you think it also has a big bearing? There's so many players that either, as you mentioned, might win one major or they get to number one very briefly, but. How do, do you think the money has a lot to do with that? I would call it near like, like an eye of the tiger. Like, cause when you're on the way up, you, you're prepared to do anything, you scrap, you fight, but then all of a sudden, maybe when you get those cre creature comforts, do you reckon that has a big bearing on today's players? No question. If you look at how many players, how many players had won majors, at least 10, at least 10. And now they can't play anymore. They won majors, not normal tournaments. Why? They suddenly got to go along and have lessons from people uh, that have never been in the arena. Now, nobody has more respect for the club pro than me, but there are pros that can teach members and juniors and ladies, but there are specialized pros that can teach professional golfers and who've been in the arena. You come to the last hole and you need a four to win the British Open on the last hole. You better know, you better have a pile of experience behind you. A lot of people say you don't need experience. You need a pile. You need to have the right mind. You better know what you, that you got to know the kind of shot you're going to play. You're not going to sit there and hope you're going to hit a shot. You know the type of shot you're going to hit, whether it's low, a hook, a slice, high. You know what you're going to do. Nobody can teach you that. There's a little thing called it. And I've only seen in my 72 years of playing, plus minus only 15 golfers that have got it. Now, can I tell you what it is? No, nobody can tell you. It's indefinable. It's just something you, you take Weisskopf. Weisskopf was a better golfer than Nicholas, but he won one major. So I, you look at, you just take a golf tournament now in America when they tour for 156 guys. The hundredth guy basically hits the ball as well as the guy who's number one, mm. but he doesn't win like that guy. Why? But you know, it, it's a little thing called knowing how to play golf. Now you say, well, a man's a professional golfer. He knows how to play. Not necessary. The man who knows how to play the most on the US tour is Jordan Speed. He really knows because basically he is, I think, the worst striker of a ball on the tour. And he's got a five golf faults in his swing. He's the Severiano of America. This guy has got it. I just love this guy. I just love the way he competes. He's got it. He's the best player from 100 yards in. There's nobody in the world that can uh, compete against him from 100 yards in. And he's lying number six on the money list. So this is the man I take my hat off to. This is the man that youngsters should be looking at, not looking at somebody like the Shambro who hits the ball 400 yards. Because <laughs> putting is what wins golf tournaments. The mind and putting and being a competitor, even competitor, even if you're a short hitter. Now, long hitting is an asset, but it's not a necessity. Yeah. Now, who was the who was the biggest uh, per, who was the person who had the most profound effect on you, and why? Uh, golf wise, you mean? Yeah. Oh, just in general, that it, it had. Oh, such in general, a, uh, yeah. Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill. Uh, you know, you have September 11 in America, which was a severe tragedy. But Churchill had that almost every month. I mean, what he went through and the command of the English language 
and the courage and how he inspired people. He was a genius. And then I spent a lot of time with President Mandela and we raised a lot of money for young black children. And he was a saint. He was a remarkable man. He's the only man whose feet I've ever kissed because he was such a gentleman and such a saint and so full of love after yeah. being in jail for 20 years for doing the right thing, not the wrong thing. And then, you know, people like Mahatma Gandhi who changed the nation. Mother Teresa who gave her life for not a cent. You know, there are a lot of people, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, who knew how to run a country. No drugs. You drug peddler and you, you get youngsters on drugs, you're dead within the next week. Now, you had a court case, but he said, I'm not going to have one man affect a thousand people. I'd rather kill that person than have them kill all thousand of my people. So there were no drugs in Singapore. Isn't that what we want? The world's the free world is riddled with drugs for children. Number two, no papers in the street, no graffiti on the walls. What right do you have to go putting your graffiti on my investment that I have in my building? You have no right whatsoever. So Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, who Singapore was annexed by the Japanese and what they went through is living hell. And he turned out to be probably the best, run, not probably, definitely the best run country in the world. And obviously over your journey, you've met a lot of, famous people i know you you touched on mandela but who who was the one that you spent time with that you learned the most from you know i've got a letter right here i can show you from president trump this is the third letter he's written to me since my wife died a month ago he is so concerned are you all right gary is there anything i can do when i play golf with him he says to his greenkeeper, come over here. He puts his arm around and says, you've done a great job. When we had breakfast and meals, he said to the waitress, ma'am, thank you for looking after us so well. Somebody comes for an autograph. He's so nice. It's just amazing how people get a perception of somebody. He wasn't a diplomat. He wasn't a diplomat. But I mean, you want a man to run the country well. Now, you know, a lot of people hated him and a lot of people loved him. But once you run for politics, the day you become president of the United States of America, 51% of people love you, 49% of people don't like you. Mm. But I judge people as I find them. I don't judge people as the way you judge them. It's my prerogative to judge somebody. And I watch the way he handles people and his kindness and, that, and the way he raises his children and his wife, Melania, is such a thorough gentleman. I found him a very, very nice person. A lot of people are scared to say this. I'm not because that's my opinion. But there have been so many wonderful people in the world, you know, to follow uh, and great admiration for so many people. People that anybody who contributes to society, I love. People who raise money. I don't want to be known. I don't believe in a legacy, quite honestly. People, I can tell you there, if I went to universities around the world today and said, who's Winston Churchill? I guarantee you 25% of them know him. Mm. Uh, in America, I tell you, I don't know how many would know him. People forget that and understandably so. So I believe you, while you're here, you've got to have lots of love in your heart. You've got to contribute to society to the best you can. I've raised millions, tens of millions for people all around the world and that gives me far more joy to change the lives of people that don't have much because I suffered like a junkyard dog as a young person. And I've never forgotten what it is like to struggle and to try and help people. And so we all have different opinions on what we like and what we don't like and our paths that we choose. It's so interesting when it comes to health and fitness that now it's in vogue and you see the, the the trailers on tour and we've all got uh, people go to gyms. <laughs> but isn't it amazing when you think back that you were nearly seen, and I remember having, I remember there was, the. do you remember the old books that you'd done with, it was like the, they did the drawings yes. about, yes. and I remember having those as a kid. And I remember like reading those at the time. And even there was, I think there was some things in there about health and fitness then. Yeah. Just give everyone a bit of an insight about because you had that mindset of around health and fitness it was nearly seen in those times as a little bit quirky and strange wasn't it 
you were known as a kook. You, you, were really, <laughs> uh, you know, really, I mean, uh, even Arnold Palmer and Jack Lickless, my best friend, said, Gary, you cannot do weight training and play golf. You're going to hurt yourself. One of the famous golf architects, I was squatting with 325 pounds the night before I won the US Open to win the Grand Slam. And he said, Gary Player, he wasn't shy. He said in the papers, Gary Player will never win a tournament past 35. Well, I'm 86 now, going strong as a 40-year-old. I said to him an SMS the other day. I said, listen, you know, I'm going to live to 100, but it's, 100 won't take long. Make sure you've got a nice course up there that's a Gary Player design and a Gary Player gymnasium. I've got an email back immediately saying, I'll design a course, but it's not going to be yours. <laughs> it, it, so, it, it, and you it, see, it, what people don't understand is that exercise with weights and exercise in general strengthens your bones it improves your blood circulation your breathing which is important which affects your brain and your entire body it's just a shame that people don't worry about health very few people on the planet really worry about health which is a shame over i'm in the the thoroughbred racehorse business and i can tell you weight stops a train you got mm. a good horse you want to stop him from winning just put 10 pounds on him and see what happens. And a human being, they carry 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds of weight on them. Well, you're going to die. That's as simple as that. If you get overweight, you're going to die early unless you're a freak. Now, you, you, must, have, you must have had a little giggle, giggle to yourself that when Tiger Woods came into the game, and then he started going to the gym and all the other players then copied Tiger. But you must have sat back with a little grin on your face going... I know a guy that did this 20 or 30 years ago and, and everyone thought he was a, a little bit strange. <laughs> yeah. Well, before he was born. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, it's nice to know that I started weight training in golf with a man called Frank Stranahan. Yeah. And uh, it's just, you know, it was just so refreshing for me. Wherever I went, I went to the gym, and here I'm 86, and I've just come back from the gym. I feel so good. You know, it's just, it makes you feel so good. And what's the greatest thing that is bestowed upon a human being is health. Oof. Longevity, living a long time is a privilege. And to live a long time without suffering and being sick, there's nothing worse. I saw my wife die with pancreatic cancer. Just so sad to see. Yes, most of us will probably suffer before we die. But if we only get, as Churchill said, the youth of a nation are the trustees of posterity. If only we could get the schools and the parents to teach their children how to eat properly and also to exercise. What a wonderful world and what, a, what it would do for one's country if everybody was in great shape the productivity of your country is going to be tenfold and everybody wants to see their country do well. And just, I know you've touched on it a few times, but just give everyone an insight into, and I don't, I'm not one for mentioning age, but you are, you're nearly, nearly 86 years old, but just give everyone an insight into a, what a basic day of training looks like for Gary Player. Well, first of all, I'll be 86 in a few days' time. I never go into the gym thinking I'm old. I always go into the gym, and I, I think I'm young. It's strange, isn't it? I yeah. think I'm young because I'm so fit and I work out so hard. There again, the mind takes over. I don't think I'm 86. I work every part of my body. I work my neck, and then I work my arms, and I work my shoulders, and I work my chest. I do a lot of core a lot of work on my core because your core holds your body together every it prevents you from having back trouble and 15 million balls in my life i shouldn't be able to walk with back problem according to the clinic over here so and then i work on my legs then i get on the treadmill i run flat out i run backwards i run sideways i do all kinds push-ups uh, I send the ball over the trail, lie the ball behind my back. I do all kinds of exercise to build my all-round body. But main effort, main effort in the core. Because that is in every sport. It's every sport is regulated and performed by the core. Whether you're pitching a baseball, 
whether you're boxing, whether it's tennis, whether it's, if you play golf, everything is the core, not the hands. The weakest part of your body are your hands. The ball by rotating your core, shot, is all rotation of the hips, javelin, every sport, from the hips, I watch these little Japanese guys breaking a brick with their hands. And they just tell me they take their hip and choo, rotate it. And that's what we got to teach all the young guys in Australia that are playing golf. Rotate that hip, rotate that hip. So those are what I do. But I used to think that exercise was the most important, but I think eating is now the most important thing. What you eat, a lot of fruit I eat. Look, I'm not going to sit here and tell people what they must eat, but I'll tell you what I eat. I eat a lot of vegetables, a lot of cooked, a lot of raw. I eat a lot of fruit. I eat a lot of raw, raw garlic with honey. I eat a lot of red onions. I have lemon water when I go to sleep. I try not to eat bread. I don't eat, I don't eat any bacon. I took an oath to God 25 years ago never to have another ice cream or a piece of bacon. And I loved ice cream and bacon. But I realized... <laughs> that it wasn't good for me, for me, I'm talking about. I'm not saying for you. So I watch and I, I try not, I'm trying to have two meals a day now. You don't need more than two meals a day. Two meals is ample. Strictly speaking, you get by on one meal a day, but I have two meals a day and I'm trying to really under eat now and exercise and laugh, laugh, laugh a lot. Make sure you laugh a lot, but Australians do that. They've got a great sense of humour, so they don't have to worry about that. I don't know how their sense of humour is going at the moment, Gary, with the lockdowns, but I know um, in doing my research, you, it was it advice for when we get older? I know there was a, a Professor Singh where he mentioned that you need to weigh yeah. less when you get older, but why yes. do so many people not expect problems when they go the other way? They put on more weight when they get older. I don't know anybody that can honestly say when they get to 60 that they weigh less than they did when they were in their prime at, say, 22, 25. That's what, my, that's what I'm working on right now. I've got to do that. Uh, that is the, that is, that's the longevity for you. If you do that, you can have longevity. And let me tell you, um, being repetitive for longevity, long living is a privilege. I love people. I love traveling. I love playing golf. And I, I can't get enough of it. I love it, making money for underprivileged people around the world. We've changed the lives of tens of millions of people. I love doing all that kind of stuff. I love living. And so if you love living and your body is a holy temple, you've got to work at it. Luck, there's no such thing as luck. Luck is the residue of design. But you can't get, it is easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than to get the, ab unfortunately. Now, Gary, just on the topic of mental health, do you think because you've had such a, a great physical aspect to what you do, you've always been in great shape from a mental point of view? Yeah, uh, if I understand your correct your question, the mental it controls everything. Everything you do is mental. Uh, uh, that's the difference between uh, superstars and the rest. There's something that their mind does that the others don't do, and I can't tell you what it is. I don't profess to know. Nobody can define that. The mind controls every single thing you do, and what young people should be doing, because. Greatness separates athletes, businessmen, even best husbands and best fathers. There's something that separates the, these kind of people. Uh, and Gary, on to my favorite topic that I love talking about and to do with my hat that I'm wearing. Um, it must be incredibly humbling each year to kick off the Masters with the ceremonial tee shot. Is it your... Is it your goal to be doing that ceremonial tee shot when you're 100 years old? <laughs> Funny enough, I was talking to Ernie Els today, and I, I was telling him, I said, you know, I've only got 14 years to go to be 100. <laughs> I want to get on that first tee at Augusta with a skirt, and I'm going to go to the lady, and just hit it, because it's all down here from the ladies' tee, and I'm going to just get the ball started, and it's going to run 100 yards, and I'm going to say, yeah. 
And I know our internet signals are a little bit skew if at the moment. Very Just bad. on Bryson DeChambeau, what's the thoughts on uh, Bryson? Because when you think about it, he's very much cut maybe from the same cloth as you, being on the physical and the mental side. But what's thoughts on Bryson? I think he's fantastic for the game. I really like him. I find him a very nice gentleman. Uh, I'm just so delighted that he's carrying the torch, as many others are, on looking after your body and working out. Uh, I asked him at the Masters this year about all these high protein or excessive protein that he's taking, which I am vehemently against. Um, Having spoken to the real health people of the world, they're not keen on excessive amount of protein, but he, he's very smart, this man. He said, I have my blood analyzed every two weeks. So he's on the ball. Uh, I think it's very exciting to see uh, drives being hit these prodigious distances. And let me give you a shock and say, we're in our infancy right now in 20 years time where Bryson ends up, they'll carry the ball over him because you're having all these massively big athletes. And we've never had a really a big man play golf except George Bayer, who came to Australia with me and hit those big drives. But those days, 300 yards was a big drive with that inferior equipment. But Bryson with long hitting is a big advantage, but it's not a necessity. Winning tournaments, it's putting in short game and the mind. And it's great to see women's golf uh, doing so well. These ladies are playing fantastic golf and getting a lot of young girls all over the world interested in golf. Well done for them. All right. Well, unfortunately, Gary, I'd love to sit here all day. I'm the biggest golf tragic, even though I got to play Australian rules football for many, many years. For me, it's an absolute dear honor to sit down with you. Like I said, you made a lasting impression in that brief time I met you on the practice fairway at Augusta national and just the way you've represented the game of golf, the way you go about your life. And especially in today's times and what we stand for with what I'm trying to do with walk with me, with a physical and mental mindset, you're an absolutely bloody inspiration. And I know that, uh, I know all the Aussies out there love you. I know that you love Australia and um, look, I'm from me, being the golf tragic and for someone who really tries to help people with their physical and mental health, you, you've been amazing. Thank you, mate. And I just love Australia. I'm, I'm, I'm repeating it. I just miss Australia so much and um, all the best to you and great work you're doing. Keep it up. And I was so happy to see Australia do extremely well in the Olympic games. Well done. Thanks, mate. And hey, don't write it off yet. We'll look forward. We'll get you back here one day once all this is over. And um, we look forward to seeing you out on the golf course. For someone who's won our Aussie Open seven times, we want to get you back here. Thank you, mate. I would love that. As long as I'm not too old to travel and can't see anymore, I'll be there. Hey, you're running ring, rings around everyone. So don't don't ever write that off. And if not, I will see you on the first tee for the 100th tee, tee shot, by the way. <laughs> I hope the ladies don't take offense me saying I'm going to put a skirt on. It's just that I'll be on the ladies' tee and I'd have to have a skirt on. Yeah, I know. Hey, yeah. Okay, but, cheers. Thanks, mate. Sincerely appreciate it.